The Moonshee Isles. The Moonshees off the Sword Coast were only lightly populated, but their tales focused much interest in the area. The death of the local goddess Earth Mother and the rise of the true High King, who defeated the evil god Baal and all his forces, drew attention not only to the history of those events, but to their locations as well. The islands contained three social and physical divisions. The Southern Isles were reasonably temperate and arable, and the folk in the area were primarily agrarian, though fishing and trade were important along the coasts. The Northern Isles were more rugged and cold. They were settled later by warlike northerners, many being worshippers of Tempest, who practiced herding, fishing, and hunting, and frequently raided the lands of the folk. The Corin Archipelago of the far north was useless for anything other than pirate bases, though a few hardly souls survived by rising livestock, fishing and woodcutting. The lands of the Northmen. The best known locations of the north were, according to the tales, Omen's Isle and Norland. The former was the site of the Iron Keep of Thelagar Iron Hand, a veritable bastion of stone. As mighty as it was, however, it could not withstand the earthquake force sent against it by Baal, and was leveled. Oman's kingdom included the coastal villages of northern Gwyneth as well. A far less pretentious location was Rogersheim, Norland, and the lodge of Kronark the Red. Norland contained primeval forest and vast marshes below the towering peaks of the Yuton Hammer Mountains, which formed the country's backbone. No roads and few trails cut inland. The sea was the highway, as well as the livelihood of the venturesome Northmen. Norheim, the lands of Rag Hammerstad, joint commander of the eastern fleet of the Dark Walker War, was a scattering of islands that were smaller versions of Norland. Rugged, primeval, and with an even more severe climate, it is little wonder the Northmen were tough and adventurous. The lands of the folk. Moray, Sunset, Flamestard, Snowdown, and the southern parts of the Gwyneth and Aleron composed the lands of the folk. The kingdoms of Corwell on Gwyneth and Caladir on Aleron were by far the most important. Almost all the action and the important tales occurred there. Corwell was the oldest and second largest of the realms of the folk in the Monche Islands. It occupied the southern half of Gwyneth, encompassing the lands south and east of Murloc Vale. Lyrath Forest blanketed the entire southern portion of Corwell, making it the wildest part of the kingdom. The forest trees and thousand-foot-high central ridge separated the settled lands of Corwell from the lawless pirate havens hidden along the rugged south coast. The pirates were not the only undesirable elements in Lyrath, however. As Prince Tristan's hunting party discovered, giant furbolgs also had entered the forest, having come from their usual home in Murloc Vale. Murloc Vale lay north of Corwell. Although the Vale was not part of Corwell, it had always been revered by the folk, for the wilderness was sacred to the goddess. During the time of Tristan Kendrick, the Vale became important to Corwell, for far more sinister reasons. It was there that the evil god Baal sent the Dark Walker, Kasgaroth, and it was there that Baal himself made physical contact with a prime material plane. Corwell's fate, and indeed that of all the Moonshays, was tied to that of Murloc Vale. Highlands nearly surrounded Murloc Vale. At the east end, near where the mountain wall swung northwest, were the highest mountains of Gwyneth. Immediately east was an enclave separate from Corwell, Sinoria, the hidden home of the Lawir Elves. Between these two wild areas, Lyrath Forest and Murloc Vale, the sparse population of Corwell was scattered through the central plain and along the coast. The way of life in Corwell was simple. Most of its people were farmers or fishing folk, depending on their location. Even the king's fortress, Kyre Corwell, and its nearby village were relatively small and unimposing. Caladir on the southern Aleron was far more populous than Corwell. The Port Le Willin was the largest settlement the Prince of Corwell had seen, and the city of Caladir seemed truly magnificent. Even Elmnister had been favorably impressed with Caer Caladir. Almost all of Caladir was excellent agricultural land. Durnal, the only large expanse of forest, 
seemed to be inhabited by nothing more dangerous than O'Rourke bandits. The mountains of the north were an excellent source of metals and minerals. The only roads on either island were those connecting the major ports on opposite ends of each kingdom, with rough trails winding to other locations. Corwell Town As Corwell was the oldest realm of the folk, Corwell Town was their oldest settlement. The deep harbor at the east end of Corwell Firth was one of the finest in the Moonshays. A high stone breakwater with a gap wide enough to admit only one vessel at a time guarded the placid harbor. Docks for dozens of vessels lined the shore within. Shallow drafted longships, however, could land on the gravelly beaches outside the breakwater, a disadvantage that allowed the Northmen to attack. The land rose from the lowlands at the end of the firth to rolling moors. One such hill, a mile from Corwell Town, were the halfling delves of Low Hill. Closer to the fishing town, and more important, however, was a far steeper and rockier prominence, Corwell Knoll, site of the King's Castle. All that stood between the townspeople and the Northmen during a landward attack was a low wooden fence. The fence was only four to six feet high when Cosgroth forces arrived, and when the unfortunate community was beset again a year later by the Sawagin and the living dead. The fence was even lower, no more than waist high. Although the town was small, it had gates in all four directions, west to Dinat and Ponswine, south to Lowell, east to the eastern entraves via the Corwell Road, and north to the castle. In spite of Corwell's town's importance as the capital of the folk realm, it was a small fishing village with hardly more than a hundred wooden cottages standing behind the more substantial stone warehouses and commercial buildings near the harbor. The town included three inns, the Boar's Tusk, also known as the Inn of the Great Boar, the Red Stag, and the Black Eel. In scouting Corwell prior to the Sawagin attack, Hobarth first visited the Boar's Tusk, then moved to the more quiet Black Eel tucked away on a dark lane beside the waterfront, for his meeting with Ponswain. Two other locations of note were the Central Square and Friar Nolan's Chapel to the New Deities. The Central Square served as a marketplace in peaceful times, and thus set back from the Rokos Harbor. During the defense of the town, it was a natural gathering place for troops. The chapel was also important during the attacks, for the friar had healing powers, and the chapel served as an infirmary. Like many walled settlements, not all important locations lay within the walls. Beyond the spur road that curved along the wall from Corwell Road to the Castle Road lay a huge, open commons field. Its most popular use was for the festivals such as green grass or the spring equinox. At such times, tents filled with commons, and merchants provided a multitude of goods and services, Ale served by the local innkeepers, exotic entertainment, wares from near and far. Even Friar Nolan had a tent opposite the entrance to the Druid's Grove. Like an eye in the midst of a storm, the Corwell Druid's Grove was an island of peace in the midst of clamor. It stood beyond the commons field, but during the largest events it was surrounded. A nearly symmetrical ring of massive oaks formed the boundary of the grove with ancient archways marking the entrance and scattered through the grove. At the grove's heart was a pool of steel water that glowed a milky white, a moon well, which flowed straight from the Earth Mother. Three other important sites lay west of the festival grounds. On the rising moors was the Great Barrows Hall, in which Arlen was laid to rest after Tristan's ill-fated expedition to Lyrath Forest. The hall lay amidst the common barrow field, Closer to the north gate was a small grove of trees, in which the blood riders hid, awaiting the folk's attempt to break out of the beleaguered town and reach the castle. The third was the castle itself, Caer Corwell. Caer Corwell. North of Corwell town stood the fortress of the Kendricks, Caer Corwell. It was constructed atop a hundred-foot-high rocky prominence that rose from the rolling moors, the last remnants of the outlying islands to the north. The road spiraled up the knoll to a single castle gate. 
only the steeds of the blood riders, magically endowed, were able to climb the steep hillside. The top of the knoll was flattened, providing a fairly level site for the fortress. A wooden palisade edged the crest, with guard towers at each corner, connected by platforms for defenders. The gatehouse stood at the center of the south wall. This large tower held an arched tunnel-like opening that was barred by massive oaken gates and iron portcullis. The portcullis was high enough to allow riders on horseback to pass, and even when it was only half open, Larrick ducked under. Once into the archway, the attackers could either break the portcullis and pass straight into the courtyard, or pass through a small slide door of the tunnel and climb the spiral stair to the trap door that accessed the gatehouse platform with its 50 defenders and the palisade. Corwell Keep When Elmnister reached Corwell from Colladir, he was surprised by the rusticity of Care Corwell. In contrast to Caladir's graceful spires, Corwell Keep hunched atop its knoll, a sturdy blocky granite building with three broad towers. Opposite the gatehouse, a wide stairway rose to the keep's huge oaken doors. These were slightly recessed in the thick wall, forming an alcove on each side, and the doors opened directly into the great hall. In the most protected part of the first level was the council chamber, a comfortably lavish room with a great hearth for rugs and a polished oak council table, large enough to seat at least eight. King Kendrick, Tristan, Robin, Karen, the garrison commander and Cantrev lords Dianet, Coward, and Norwal. Space for a few additional lords such as Ponswain also was available. Other rooms on the first level included servants' quarters, pantries, access stairs to the cellar for ice, meat, ale, and wine, and a cistern filled by the springs deep below the keep. Among the rooms of the level two was the king's study. Occasionally small private meetings were held there, but primarily it served as a comfortable workroom. In addition to work areas, the study held a couch, chairs, and a hearth. Its east-facing window was broken by the assassin Rasfallow in his leap to the courtyard thirty feet below. The king's apartment was on this level for convenience. Here too were spacious quarters for dignitaries and small rooms for functions such as Randolph, captain of the guard. The windows of the third level were fifty feet above the courtyard. 20 higher than those of the second level. Robin's room stood near the head of the staircase, with Tristan's beyond. To reach the door to the highest tower, Robin made her way around the corner, then into another hall. A trapdoor gave access from the top of the spiral stair to the open platform with its black Hendrick banner. Above the tower flew Karen's falcon, Sable, who beckoned the companions to rescue the bard in Murloc. Later Robin defended the castle from here with her newly learned druidic skills, and finally the possessed Gana Moor singer landed here in bird form, shape changing into the temptress who drove Tristan and Robin apart. The Big Cave When Sable beckoned Robin and Tristan to follow him to rescue Karen, the faithful falcon led them to a massive stone edifice in the fens of Falcon, the temple of the furballs, which the giant dubbed the Big Cave. The front of the fortress-like temple stretched 600 feet. Dareth discovered no windows, and only two sets of doors, front and back. Luckily, the fairy dragon Newt knew of a less obvious route. Several hundred yards from the side of the temple ran a gully that emptied into the marshes. A drainage tunnel led directly towards the building, broken only by a monster pool. Once under the temple, the companions climbed a vertical pipe to an iron grate that gave access to the passageway. From the original passageway they had entered, the companions walked stealthily towards a distant light. A torch, next to a giant sleeping by a locked iron door. This treasure room contained not only Karen's bow, but fabled sword of Kimmerich Hugh. In the midst of the fortress was the Furbrook's Entertainment Hall, an arena centered on a gory deathbed. Cameron the Unicorn was being held in the adjacent deathbed, but broke the gate and raced through the temple, his senses leading him unerringly towards the exit. As the companions approached a four-way intersection, the Unicorn appeared from the corridor ahead. He turned into the passageway to the right, and Robin knew instinctively he meant for them to enter the left one. They ran to the nearest corner and ducked into the intersecting hallway. 
Robin sensed Karen's presence. With Karen rescued, they began to retrace their path. Meanwhile, Cameron led the fur box on a merry chase, apparently even doubling back over the part of his earlier route so that the companions at one point could hear the pursuit in a parallel corridor. Just as they skirmished with the search party, the unicorn reappeared from the corridor ahead of them and killed the last giant. With Cameron, they continued along the corridor, which was lined with several doors. Sensing fresh air, they opened one of the doors and found themselves in the largest chamber of the building. Edging around a mound of coal 40 feet high, they reached the immense rear doors of the temple. As a parting gift, they set the coal ablaze. A year later, the companions again entered the temple, but that time they crept into the abandoned ruins. The lower level had been almost entirely below ground, and the small rooms and passages had survived the collapse of the roof during the fire. Most of the larger rooms were buried, but the companions followed a winding corridor to a roomy chamber near the rear of the building, but far enough inside to hide their fire. Treading carefully through the twisted passages, Paul Doe gained access to the remains of the upper level and discovered the intact but almost empty treasure room. A hole in the roof of a nearby corridor allowed an exit via a pile of collapsed stone. The Sacred Grove Of all the groves of Murloc Fail, none was more sacred or fair than the Sacred Grove of the Great Druid on the northeast shore of the Deep Murloc. Woods stretched for several miles along the shore, but the Sacred Grove was only a portion of the woodland. The southern boundary of the grove was the creek north of the wood's edge. The mistletoe that marked the grove's limits stood 500 yards from its heart. The heart of the grove was the moon well. It was surrounded by two rings of stones raised by the earth power of great druids in ages past. The outer ring held twelve stone arches, each formed of two massive stone pillars, supporting a third of almost equal size. The eight pillars of the inner ring, however, were standing stones arranged by pairs, without cross pieces. The Moonwell's outer ring was surrounded by a tangled hedge that opened for any approaching druid. Beyond stood massive oaks. The home of the great druid was a tiny thatched roof cottage. It was constructed so near the Moonwell rings that it appeared almost within the protective hedge when Robin approached from the far borders of the grove. Surrounding the cottage was a garden lush with wildflowers, with pleasant paths and even an occasional bench. Along the garden's edge, several aspen enclosed a grassy bower where the great druid kept animals, such as canthus, that needed healing. In the heart of the garden was a steel pool with a glassy island that could be reached via a spell-raised sand bridge. The pool was a mere widening of the bubbling stream that originated at a small waterfall and emptied into the creek bordering the grove. The beauty of the sacred grove Soon disappeared forever, though, as Baal and his minions sought to destroy the goddess and her folk. Sinoria At the eastern end of Murloc Vale rose the highest mountains of Gwyneth, forever guarding the hidden realm of the Lewir elves, Sinoria. Only three passes won through the peaks to reach that enchanted realm, and though the cliff-lined paths were wide, they were a maze to any not trained in their secret ways. In spite of its airy-like location, Sinoria was relatively level. Its gently rolling fields amidst the towering peaks made it appear almost like an ancient volcano, or perhaps a window cut of dense rock that resisted erosion. Runoff from the many peaks gave Sinoria a bounty of waterfalls, streams and lakes. From the time Tristan and his companions were led blindfolded into the upland vale, the music of the falls was constantly into the air, and only Karen's discordant harp tunes prevented the traveler's permanent enchantment. The Lawir dwelt in the city of Chrysalis, whose glass mineral crystal and silver towers rose from the island hill in the middle of the valley. Its magnificence was different from, but in harmony with, the pastoral landscape. None of the folk could ever report its whereabouts, however for all were blindfolded before entering. Rumors held that to behold the beauty of Sinoria meant sure madness. 
There were three other significant locations in Sinoria. Two were magic-related. Mirror Lake, which answered questions, and the Grove of Meditation, which enhanced one's magical or fighting abilities. The third was the horse farm that housed the steeds of the Night Sisters of Sinoria and the mighty stallion Avalon, who escaped to give service to Tristan. The Dark Walker War When the largest army in Northern Moonshe history convened at the Iron Keep for a pre-war council, it planned to smash Corwell and bisect the Folklands so that all the South eventually would fall. Thelgar Ironhand, the mightiest Northern King, refused to take part, then dramatically reversed his opinion the next morning. He had been consumed by Kazgoroth, the Dark Walker. The Beast ordered 160-ship fleet of Gwenarok and Hammerstadt to sail against Eastern Corwell, for those Cantrov's destruction would prevent assistance to the capital. Delagar's army plus those of six lesser kings left a day later for the strike against Kerr Corwell. Given normal sailing times and no delays, the landing at Kerr Corwell would have been about three days after the eastern Cantrevs were attacked, but both forces were delayed. As he prepared to meet the Leviathan, the beast fitted all 240 of his ships with rams, which slowed their speed. The Leviathan damaged the fleet far worse than anticipated, however sinking a hundred ships and wrecking so many others that the fleet had to be dry docked for many days. When the fleet was again underway, the winds were capricious, forcing the Northmen to row and preventing passage through the Firth for several days more. Meanwhile, the Eastern Army fell behind schedule three days because of the late rendezvous with the Blood Riders, another two days in the mountains and a final day because of the battle at Freeman's Dawn. While the delay of the Western fleet was greater, the result was the same. The Eastern Cantrevs sent refugees, not warriors, to the Battle of Kerr Corwell, or so it seemed. The Battle of Freemen's Down After almost two weeks of raiding in the East, the army and the Blood Riders reunited briefly at Cantrev McShehan to force the refugees west. Hammerstad's half of the forces were to herd the folk slowly along the road, while Gunnarak's army, including the 100 blood riders, Gunnarak's personal guard, was to be guided swiftly through the mountains. Then south, cutting across Corwell Road ahead of the refugees and trapping them between the two armies. Thanks to delays forced by Gena Moonsinger, Tristan and his companions managed to emerge from the pass from Sinoria just ahead of Gunnarak's army and the prince rallied the approaching Cantrev's refugees into a valiant stand at Freeman's Down. Tristan chose his battleground carefully. At the end of the narrow valley from the mountains stood a low hill. Several hundred yards across, a flatland, a deep stream cut along the border, with a thick tangle of vegetation beyond. A drainage ditch crossed the flat from the hill to the river, forming a partial bunker. Four hundred folk guarded the ditch, with two hundred more held in reserve. The hill's apparently empty crest actually was a trap, hiding forty archers. And Finland's sixty dwarves, the twenty sisters of Senoria harried Gunnarok army as it descended by a narrow valley, driving the troops into a tangle of growth and fallen trees prepared earlier by Robin and the dwarves. By the time the army broke through, only two hours remained until dark. Meanwhile, the sisters had joined the other hidden forces on the hill, when the bulk of the army charged straight towards the folk guarding the ditch. Tristan ordered the archers into position. The army outnumbered Tristan's volunteers four to one, however, and the northmen breached a wide gap. Suddenly, the blood riders broke ranks, intending to cut through the archers and flank the line of defenders below. Their charge was met mid-slope by the sister knights. Although vastly outnumbered, the sisters' downhill momentum was sufficient to disrupt the blood riders. The few fur bulks of the murloc, who had joined the army, lumbered after the blood riders and found themselves in the midst of a berserk attack by Finolin's dwarves. The giants hastily retreated. As the blood riders and sisters had first clashed, Tristan signaled to the reserves and the breach in the line was closed. 
with fearful losses and grieved and desperate folk held against the Northmen, forcing them to a standstill, and the blood riders and infantry withdrew. The folk and their prince were elated, but as Karen warned, they had merely met a small demoralized army at the end of a hard march and held it up for a few hours. The Battle of Kerr Corwell The true thrust of the Darkwalker War was against the capital city, Kerr Corwell. The same day Tristan faced half of the Eastern Army, his father struggled to prevent the landing of the Western Fleet. King Kendrick was particularly successful, for Druid made wind and catapults drove back the fleet from a landing on the docks, but not until a blast from the beast collapsed a building onto him. The long ships were beached on the gravely shores. When a messenger reached Tristan and Robin the next day, Avalon galloped to Kerr Corwell by dusk. In the king's absence, the lords fight for more glory than victory and had deployed their forces outside the town walls. Even as Tristan brought the king's retreat order to the castle, they were driven into town. During the planning season that followed, a sister arrived with the news that the knights were just north of the town, and the dwarves would arrive within two to three hours. An hour after their arrival, the evacuation of the town began. Lord Court's company bolted, leaving Lord Dinettes to be massacred. The rest were forced to retreat to the town, but were cut off. The next day the Northmen streamed into the town from the south and east and forced the defenders towards the north gate. Tristan ordered an attempt to break through the castle. Briefly they were trapped on the road, until Robin's magic opened a path through the blood riders. They had reached Kerr Corwell. For a week the beast prepared, then on the eighth day his attack began. The Furbolgs, battering the gate, were driven back by Tristan's trusty companions and Finuel's dwarves. But the siege engines burned a breach in the palisade. The folk fought heroically, losing then regaining control of the gap against the Northmen. But they could not stand against the supernatural charge of the blood riders. The riders rode straight up the steep slope at blurring speed, cutting like a scythe through the line of the folk while the scattered defenders were slaughtered. The elven remaining sisters of Sonoria ran into the stables to hide. Acting on Robin's plan, they charged across the courtyard, drew the blood riders to them, then turned in swift retreat. As they drew ahead of the blood riders, Robin cast a fiery chasm that destroyed all but one of the riders. Drained by her feet, Robin lay unknowing, as Leric stealthily carried her out of the fray, unseen until the last moment. Behind the blood riders, Kasgaroth had immediately led the Northmen through the breach. But even as Tristan and his remaining forces turned to face this final menace, unexpected help arrived. Led by Canthus, the wolves of the goddess fell upon the troops still climbing the knoll, and the Northmen streamed away towards their ships as the beast was revealed by his anger and the last of his troops fled. Care Corwell had survived. Care Allison, east of Gwyneth, an isle magically submerged in the straits amidst the three major lands of the folk, was another location even less known than the hidden lands of Sinoria. Care Allison, Kimerick Hughes, joyous wedding gift to his new bride, Care Allison, was doomed to become a tomb and thereafter appeared only to a favored few. The castle was designed for both strength and beauty. It was smaller than Kerr Corwell, but was more finely constructed with blocks of softly glowing rose quartz shaped in delicately proportioned spires. High battlement walls, broken by only a few windows, formed a roughly rectangular complex with a single gate closed by a drawbridge and portcullis. Dareth was able to scale the gate and drop over the top to lower the drawbridge, admitting Tristan and Ponswain to the small courtyard. The courtyard was lined with ornate columns, and its doors and sweeping stairways gave way to the rooms and balconies tucked into the walls. The largest of these lay opposite the gate, Queen Allison's Keep. A wide, misty stairway led to the two massive oaken doors strapped with bronze. Tristan and Dareth were unable to enter the keep through them, however, 
for pulling the door's bronze rings activated a trap that sent them plummeting down a wide shaft into a 30-foot cavern lined with rough-hewn stone. They might have remained in the trap, but the centuries of submergence emergence had weakened the stone. Seeking an outlet, water in the trap had entered an underground drain nearby, and Dareth widened this opening sufficiently to allow the companions to swim through it. Once in the underground system, Tristan discovered a four-foot shaft that slanted shallowly enough to permit climbing. The shaft ended within the wall near the upper end of the slightly slanting corridor. Iron doors broke the inner wall about every 30 feet. Tristan forced open the closest one and discovered a guard's room. The door on the far wall led back into the courtyard, while the remaining door entered directly into the Great Hall of the Keep. The Great Hall was awesome. High-colored windows revealed the immense granite columns lining the walls. At the end of the hall opposite the great entry doors, a passageway led deeper into the keep. Dareth ascended a stairway on the right and found himself on a balcony lined with rooms, one of which held treasure. Meanwhile, Tristan was drawn to a corridor left of the great hall and after passing through two archways entered a light-filled room. The floor of the room was marble and the domed ceiling was inlaid with gold but the glow emanated from the crystal beer of Alison. Rising, Alison returned to him the sword of Simeric Hugh and prophesied the coming of the new High King. Tristan and Dareth were not the only visitors to care Alison. A year later, Cole and Gwen were saved from a shipwreck by the mysterious isle. Within still another corridor branching from the Great Hall, Gwen discovered a cozy room and there, the couple remained while the castle transported them not only to Norland, but to Corwell Firth. There, it ran aground and was later explored at leisure, giving access to its scrolls, artifacts, and treasures. Caladir The largest city of the folk lay on the eastern shore of Alaron, the port of Caladir. After the rise of Simeric Hugh, the High King moved his seat of government from Corwell to this most populous locale, and here he raised the mighty fortress of Caer Caladir. The city. Caladir stood at the southern end of Whitefish Bay. The vast harbor was protected by a druid-raised breakwater and lined by a seawall. The city. Caladir stood at the southern end of Whitefish Bay. The vast arbor was protected by a druid-raised breakwater and lined by a seawall. The folk were not great seafarers, but alongside their sturdy fishing boats lay dozens of trading galleons and a pair of longships from the Sword Coast cities, and a huge shipyard was in use along one side of the large dock area. Beyond the docks, the walled city was bright and cheerful, with Caer Caladir gleaming over all. Two major roadways served Caladir. One ran west along the southern edge of the fortress, then curved north to the mines of Harehead Mountains, while the major highway of Alaron, the High King's Road, traveled almost due south. As in most large port cities, Caladir's inns, taverns, warehouses, and other businesses were constructed along a web-like network of narrow streets and alleyways near the docks. As Fiona led Tristan's group to her father's home, she steered them past several fish houses, through one of the factories down an alley around a corner and through a narrow street. Fiona's house was a small ramshackle structure, but it was not quite ordinary. In the narrow hallway, beyond the first hearth-warmed room, a rug hid a heavy trapdoor from which a steep stair ran to a cellar, fitted as a blacksmith's shop. Several cots stood in a corner. A secret door from the cellar revealed a low, narrow tunnel, that led through a hatch into one of the city's storm sewers, which emptied through the seawall. This allowed Paldo to sneak out of the city. Tristan and Dareth departed the house in a cleaner, but far more dangerous way, following the street to another that led directly to the east gate of Caer Caladir. The Fortress The grandest structure in all of Monche was the fortress of the High King, Caer Caladir. It stood north and west of the city, as its white walls constructed of such fine green granite that they appeared almost to be alabaster. 
The fortress was spread over three hills, with a drawbridge and a gate on each. The central gate served the king's halls, kitchen and royal apartments. Barracks and grounds of the royal guard were accessed through the eastern gate, which was proclaimed by four scarlet banners. The third gate stood near the west, the wizard's gate. It accessed a private section of the castle reserved for the needs of the Council of Seven. The main wizard's tower, with its circular council chamber, rose in dark disharmony with the rest of the fortress, and was reachable only above ground level by a bridge. In spite of the disparate functions of these three main sections of the castle, each had ready access to the others and doubtless all could reach the dungeons. When Tristan and Dareth entered Car Caladir, they passed through the East Gate House with its towering walls. Beyond was a courtyard with a wooden barracks on the far side. Using a diagram provided by Fiona's father, they turned in a direction none of the guard officers took, following a passageway broken by several portcullises. The corridor ended in a small courtyard with the stables on the far side. An opening at the end of the stables gave way to another courtyard, which revealed a vast high-walled keep. From there an archway opened onto yet another small courtyard, with a kitchen on the left. They had reached the king's section. The door on the left opened onto a large entryway with several branching hallways. One ended on the huge kitchen with its many stoves, ovens and counters. Another led to a wide stairway that rose to a long carpeted hallway on the next level. The hall was lighted by beveled glass windows at each end and was lined with mirrors but only one door broke its entire length, the opening to a small guard room that protected the High King's chambers. Trapped by Cinder's magic in the King's room, Tristan and Dareth were imprisoned separately in one of the many enclosures of the dungeon. When Dareth escaped, he turned right from his cell to take the torch from its bracket a hundred feet away. Rounding a nearby corner, he recognized the steps down which they had been brought. These were barred at the top from the guard room above. He recovered the weapons and retraced his path to find Tristan. Beyond Dareth's cell were four empty ones, then one holding the imprisoned wizard Alexei. Tristan's cell lay some way beyond. After Tristan was freed, Alexei led down the darkened passage to a secret door. The narrow tunnel beyond descended, often as steeply as a stair, until it opened thirty feet below into a cave that continued steeply downward. When it seemed to Tristan, that they must be almost a thousand feet below ground, a narrower cave branched off to the left. Alexei led them along the narrow passage for about a hundred yards, until it reached an immense chamber, the secret meeting place of the Council of Seven. Stalactites hung from the towering ceiling, their mineral-laden waters feeding pools on the chamber floor. In the midst of the chamber was the Council's circular table, with a dozen stone chairs, but on the far side a dust-filled pit, Thirty feet across surrounded the spell-filled chest that Alexei sought. The Caverns of Caladir The subterranean passage through which Alexei led Tristan and Dareth was only one of many entrances to the vast and intricate underworld network of the Moonshays. Not long before, the caverns below Ker Caladir had been occupied by the Deep Gnomes, cozily housed in round huts in a deep-columned cavern. With Sindra's assistance, Drugar had slaughtered the harmless gnomes, and the Dark Dwarves had become yet another addition to Sindra's plan to overtake the Moonshays. After leaving the wizard's secret council chamber, Alexei returned to the original passageway. Already they were a thousand feet below ground, but the cave continued so steeply that in places they even had to climb down small cliffs to descend. When Tristan judged them to be half a mile below the surface, and an equal distance under the sea, they suddenly entered one of the Drugar's agricultural caverns. The chamber was so large that a waterfall tumbled hundreds of feet to the mushroom field floor, yet could only be faintly heard and seen. They took the straightest trail across, encountered Drugar, fled to the far side and into another cave passage, only to find their way blocked by a chasm hundreds of feet across and a thousand or more deep. A bridge once had spanned the cleft, but was now rotted away. Alexei's flying spell allowed them to cross, however. Not far beyond the chasm they entered a maze-like network of caves and caverns. Alexei discovered a shaft that rose hundreds of feet, 
The flying spell lasted just long enough for them to ascend to the only apparent exit, just in time to be greeted by Finelin and her dwarves. Finelin showed Tristan's group to a passage that ended in Dernal Forest. Meanwhile, the crusty dwarf led her followers against the Druagar. The battle took place in yet another maze-like section of the complex, which could be reached from the junction. Three narrow entrances led into the honeycomb chamber. Two were steeply inclined and the third was cut by a gorge with a drawbridge. Finelin had estimated her force to be equal to that of the Drugar, but was forced back by vast numbers. She retreated south, leading the Drugar away from the tunnels of Gwynedd. Dawn Castle Deep in a valley in the heart of Dernal Forest, many fugitives from the deluded High King and his Scarlet Guard had built an unusual city, Dawn Castle. The many homes, inns, and other structures were camouflaged so well that Tristan and Dareth thought them to be trees and natural mounds when they first arrived. There were four main entrances to the city. King's Gate faced northeast on the path from Ker Caladir. Lord's Gate was in the northwest and may have looked toward the former lands of the founder and leader of Don Castle, Hugh O'Rourke. Druid's Gate opened from the south trail towards the heart of the Druid's religion in Gwyneth. The fourth gate lay east of the Swanway, leading to secret clans and caves. Although the gates were really no more than widened avenues from the trails, they were designed to be defended. Ditches caught into the roadways, and barriers hidden in the trees could be dropped to form instant ramparts. Similar barriers were hidden all through the city. For a hundred yards on each side of the trail, the woods were quite open, allowing maneuvering room for the defenders. But beyond that space, the underbrush was encouraged into a wild tangle, broken only by occasional paths known to the residents. Just past each gateway, a dense growth of aspen formed a stockade fence surrounding a stable. In places south of the city, the trail followed the Swanway River. The placid stream also ran through the center of the town, where a small feeder creek on the west bank was dammed to form a mill pond. No bridges or paving marred the grassy openings, but walkways were instead suspended between the trees. Most of the structures were on or in the ground. A few wooden cottages were the weaver's huts, and the blacksmith's forge were easily visible. Only one of the major inns, the Burr Oak, O'Rourke's favorite spot, was in a tree. Its open balconies almost made to appear to be without walls. Other inns included the cozy, sod-roofed green meadow, where Tristan stayed, the raging boar, temporary lodgings for the wizards Cryphon and Doric, an assassin Rasfellow, and the enormous black oak to which the unconscious Robin was taken. The black oak held a huge, elegantly furnished main room. The partially screened stairway lay to a short hallway, serving the sleeping rooms. Robin's windowed room was at the back, and its door was the third from the stair. A grassy square in the heart of the city served as both market and gathering plaza. Cryphon passed by it when he was going between the raging boar and the chapel of cleric Von Burn, a simple wooden building with a meditation alcove and sleeping room, curtained off from the large sanctuary. Earlier, Cryphon and Rasfellow had visited another Doncastle dignitary, Anurin the Wizard. They entered a small aspen grove, magically separated the dense woven thorn hedge, and followed one of the smooth stone walkways until a curve in the path revealed a pool in front of the large foliage-covered manor, with the city's wizard and cleric dead, and one of the guard captains under his power. Gryphon had set the stage for the defeat of Don Castle. The Battle of the High Kings after Tristan's escape from Car Caladir, Cinder realized the prince would return to Don Castle and muster O'Rourke's outlawed people into a dangerous force. At the wizard's behest, King Carathal nervously agreed to send all four brigades against the woodland city. Cinder's plans were already in motion, however. Cryphon had already arrived at Don Castle to scout, preparing a map for Cinder, killed the wizard Anorin, seriously injured the cleric, and ensorcelled one of the O'Rourke's captains during the days before their Scarlet Guard's arrival. The stage was set for the Battle of Doncastle. The Battle of Doncastle. 
the human mercenaries of the king's army, bivouacked in the forest while the ogre brigade made its way west across the Swan May. Sindra planned to attack at King's Gate with two brigades an hour after dawn, drawing all the defenders to the quarters of the city. Thanks to O'Rourke's inept leadership, the wizard's plan worked perfectly. O'Rourke stationed archers along the rampart and in the trees around the gate, planning a rain of arrows on the attackers trying to break through the ground troops that defended the ravines in the roadway. Sindra led the king's attack, however, sending a killing gas into the frontline defenders before a single arrow was struck. Although Robin managed to disperse the gas, most defenders had already fled. O'Rourke had gone earlier, so Tristan organized the retreat, planning a stand at the river. He pulled defenders from all other parts of the city, leaving no reserves. The Ogre Brigade had been ordered to wait beyond the Lord's Gate for two hours, to allow for just this mistake. Shortly after the defenders were withdrawn, the Ogre Brigade entered. In spite of their best efforts, the rallied forces near King's Gate had been driven back towards the river, trapped between the original two brigades in the northeast and the Ogre Brigade in the northwest. Don Castle's defenses broke into a total rout. The forces fled along the streets and alleys to the south, pursued by the Scarlet Guard, as the final brigade burned the city. The Last Redoubt The four friends retreated from Don Castle to Druid's Gate, and Robin led them southwest through the forest. About a hundred of O'Rourke's men followed. The appearance of O'Rourke and Ponswain brought the force to five hundred. By the time they reached the coast, the count had risen to a thousand but they found themselves in still another trap. As the refugees topped a rise, they saw the path to the south blocked by a brigade of the Scarlet Guard. Looking back, O'Rourke pointed out the arrival of the Ogre Brigade, and almost immediately the eastern rise was lined with a third brigade of the Guard. Beyond the southern brigade, however, small figures could be seen scurrying atop the next crest, Finelin and 150 dwarves. The sturdy dwarves rolled boulders into the ranks of the Scarlet Guard, disrupting the Southern Brigade sufficiently to allow Tristan's troops to win their way to the crest of the rocky knoll. Twilight allowed the prince to view the setting for the next day's battle. Thousands of Drugar, who had pursued Finelan, milled on the south. The reunited Scarlet Guard stood north and east. Tristan's army held the high ground, and to the west lay a narrow-necked peninsula lined with a hundred-foot cliffs, a natural fortress. When the day of the battle dawned, however, the prince discovered he was even more outnumbered than before. The evil god Baal had summoned the undead of the sea to join the Sahuagin. Hundreds of undead stumbled on the southern shore amongst the Drugar, while the Sahuagin prepared to scale the cliffs. The Drugar and the undead attacked first. As the slope on the south was less steep, no rock slide could be started. O'Rourke commanded on the southern front, with Dareth, Paldo, and Ponswain supporting him. As a group of Drugar broke through the line, the outlaw lord almost single-handedly drove them back. On the north face of the knoll, Tristan, Robin, and Finelin faced the Scarlet Guard and Sahuagin. As the Sahuagin slowly slithered up the cliff, the Ogre Brigade began its climb. To catch the Ogre's self-balance, Finelin's dwarfs marched downhill and right. Tristan led her company forward to protect Robin, as she raised two elementals ahead of the ogres. While these moves were fairly successful, losses were heavy, especially among the dwarves, and the thin forces that Tristan had left atop the knoll suddenly faced the first onslaught of Sahuagin. If the Sahuagin broke through, they would cut off any hope of retreat to the peninsula. Calling reinforcements from the defenders on the south, Tristan's troops repeatedly pushed back the Sahuagin, but the reprieves only allowed time to move the troops to the final redoubt. As the last of the force passed west, tragedy fell. Tristan, Dareth, Finelan, and O'Rourke stood in the center of the rear guard. As an ogre attacked Tristan, O'Rourke stepped forward to assist the wary prince and was overwhelmed by Sahuagin. Almost simultaneously, a personal confrontation erupted at the highest point of the peninsula. Sindri materialized unexpectedly and felled Alexei. Racing uphill, Robin joined the magical battle, but her growth spell went far beyond her imaginings. The vegetation imprisoning Cinder ripped into the bedrock, opening a cleft into which both wizards fell. 
without understanding why, and at the last moment, she cast in her rune stick. The earthquake spread. The promontory was torn away from the shore, and the coast collapsed, destroying Baal's evil forces and the Scarlet Guard as well. The last fissure toppled the High King's carriage. The battle was won. But only 300 of Tristan's troops and 79 dwarves survived. As the waters calmed, a fountain formed at the edge of the new island. It held a gift from the sea, the crown of the isles. And with it, Robin invested Tristan as the new High King. The Battle of Ba Although Tristan had been crowned High King, he realized his task was not complete. Indeed, the defeat of the Dark Walker and the fall of the Black Wizards had only served to draw the personal ire of the evil god Baal. While the greatest army ever mustered in the Moonshades gathered in Kresselik, the god discovered how to physically occupy the Dark Well in Murloc Vale. When the Sawagin and Undead were ready, Baal sent them against the small communities along the Strait of Oman, then on to destroy the Iron Keep. Even Baal's cleric Hobarth failed to understand the reasons for these forays, though the bloodlust fed by the destruction strengthened Baal. The result must have surprised even the god, however. Call and Gwen of North Gwyneth fled the destruction of both their village and the Iron Keep, and eventually reached Norland aboard Care Allison. Their news and supernatural vessel convinced Grunak the Red to aid Corwell. The hastily gathered militia of Corwell Town and its two neighboring cantraps were minuscule when pitted against Baal's army. The town was overrun almost immediately, and even the arrival of the Northmen could not gain access to the castle or the community. Only the banishment of Baal was able to defeat his thousands, so while Tristan was not physically present in Car Corwell during the battle, he once again wielded the soul of Kimrick Hugh to the final victory.